Hey gang, what's a crack a lackin'? We're moving on to the stormy 60s, going from about 1960 to 1973. So that decade that we talk about as the 60s expanded more than just 10 years. It's also the time of American liberalism at high tide. But you also need to consider that we're going to take a look at a lot of conservative movements uh, that took shape within the 1960s as well. So let's go ahead and get started. In the 1960 election, John F. Kennedy chose Lyndon B. Johnson as his running mate for the Democratic ticket for president. This is a little bit of a mismatch, you might think, because Kennedy is a Massachusetts Cold Warrior. Uh, Lyndon Johnson sees himself as more of a Texas New Dealer, more in the um, tradition of Franklin Roosevelt. Kennedy is Harvard educated. He's a published author and a proven veteran. Johnson, on the other hand, went to Texas Teachers College and taught fifth grade and then high school for a time before entering politics. But since entering politics, Johnson has had an extensive experience in the Senate. He is a known and skilled politician who has a reputation for being able to get things done. And for uh, Kennedy, this is a good thing. This is his Southern strategy because Kennedy thinks that by adding Johnson to the ticket, he can bring in the votes that he may lose. That is the votes of the solid South. You see, John F. Kennedy has a few political liabilities. One, he's an extreme Northerner from Massachusetts. And two, he's a Roman Catholic. And a lot of people in the solid South still think that Roman Catholics have horns and tails. And so John F. Kennedy is going to need a Southern Protestant to balance the ticket and draw in some of those Southern votes. Well, John F. Kennedy is going to meet with formidable opposition from the Republicans. And that is going to be Eisenhower's Vice President Richard M. Nixon. Now, Americans already know Richard Nixon as a serious cold warrior, having made his case in the Alger Hiss trial when he was working for HUAC, in which he definitively proved that Alger Hiss knew Whitaker Chambers and was a secret communist in the 1930s. Then there was the famous Kitchen Debate of 1959, in which the vice president flew to Moscow and engaged in a light-hearted yet oftentimes tense debate with the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev over the benefits of capitalism versus communism. And Americans saw how Richard Nixon could think quickly on his feet and defend the American proposition against the Soviets. Now, here's Nixon's problem. Kennedy is young, he's articulate, and unfortunately for the heavy-bearded Richard Nixon, he looks really good on television. For the new generation of Americans, those who have grown up in the Cold War after World War II, these two guys to the left seem to represent an older and more out-of-touch era. And the Kennedys, on the other hand, they represent a fresh start. Camelot is what they call them. And there's Jacqueline Kennedy and, of course, John Kennedy and their two boys. A moment of high drama in the election of 1960 happens when the very first televised debate is going to occur between the two candidates, Richard M. Nixon, the Republican, and John F. Kennedy, the Democrat. Now, Richard M. Nixon refused any makeup. He just thought that was unnecessary. Americans have known me for years. This would be foolish to go caking on makeup. And he comes across looking rather old and haggard. Now, part of this wasn't his problem. He had been suffering from a uh, long-term illness and had actually been hospitalized in the weeks before the debate. And so when he comes on television, Americans see him as, well, old. Now, Kennedy, on the other hand, had spent the last few weeks sunning himself in the Florida Keys and brushing up on foreign policy. And so when Americans see Kennedy on TV, he appears to be fresh, hip, suntanned, and, well, just looking pretty darn good. And so this is an interesting point about the election, uh, the televised election in 1960. Those who, uh, who heard the debate on radio thought that Nixon had definitively won. 
Now, on the other hand, those who watched it on television thought that Kennedy had won. And there's been a lot of debate over uh, to, to what extent this is you know, really true or, or whatever, because radio listeners also tended to be older and older people tend to vote Republican then and now. And so maybe there's a little bit too much being uh, made of this how great Kennedy looks or something like that. Anyway, just a thought. Television definitely did influence the election of 1960 and probably, I mean, we can definitely say, swung a lot of of middle-of-the-road voters toward the Democratic Party. So here is the electoral map from the election of 1960. As you can see, this is the closest popular vote in all of U.S. history. Kennedy, the Democrat, lost two states and 15 electoral votes to Harry F. Byrd, who was a conservative Democrat from Virginia, and he had not even agreed to run. But the electors in both Alabama and Mississippi decide they could not bear to have John F. Kennedy representing the Democratic Party, and so they simply swallowed their pride and they voted for a man who was not running just yet. But this is a very interesting election because you see, once again, the solid South beginning to break apart over some of the divisions that are occurring within the Democratic Party. We saw this in 1948 with Harry uh, Harry S. Truman. After Harry S. Truman and the Democratic Party had endorsed a civil rights platform that the solid South did not agree with. And so here's a closer look. So you can see the popular vote over there, very very, very close, within just around 100,000 votes. That's a very, very slim margin. And then, of course, you have John F. Kennedy taking 303 electoral votes and Richard Nixon taking 219. And then there's poor Harry F. Byrd, who's wondering what he's doing there, taking 15 votes. Thank you to two defector states in the Solid South. Following his election, John F. Kennedy gives one of the more memorable inaugural addresses in all of American history. He says, Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. This much we pledge, and more. Now, of course, John F. Kennedy is talking to the nation that has very narrowly elected him as president, but he's also sending somewhat of a coded message to, well, the Soviet Union, of course. And so if you read between the lines, he's telling the Soviet Union, listen up, Nikita Khrushchev, I can still go to the brink of war, just as my Republican predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower, did. So don't think you can get away with anything while I'm on while, while I'm in the president seat, Soviets. He goes on, to those people in the huts and villages across the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves for whatever period is required. Not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. And again, I think you have to um, sort of decode the message here and think he's also speaking to the Soviet Union. Hands off the third world, such as Asia and Africa and Latin America because here come the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is an organization that John F. Kennedy um, helped to organize to send to the so-called Third World and help them develop their economies and develop their infrastructure and even do things such as help people find water and provide basic medical care. And of course, this is a humanitarian effort and John F. Kennedy is to be applauded for that, but there is a secondary mission here as well. Remember the Marshall Plan? It wasn't just about feeding people. It was also about making sure that communism is not an attractive option to people who have very little. Finally, John F. Kennedy says, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace before the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all of humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. So, I'm still open to talking out our problems, dear Soviet friends. Unfortunately, the most, uh, the, the, the most consequential 
arms reduction agreement is not going to happen under JFK, and it's not going to happen under uh, the, the president that follows him, Lyndon Johnson. It's going to happen under Richard Nixon. So let's have another look at what JFK just said. He had promised, let every nation know that we p shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to, sh to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And of course, he's letting the Soviets know that we're not backing down from the challenges involved in the Cold War. And so Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union, issues his own challenge right back to Kennedy by saying, we will support wars of national liberation wherever in the world they occur. So in other words, we're not backing down either, Kennedy. The Cold War is still on. Well, do you remember Cuba? The United States assumed leadership of Cuba in 1898 following the Spanish-American War, and it becomes an American protectorate under the Platt Agreement of 1906. Well, in 1959, during Eisenhower's administration, a revolutionary named Fidel Castro overthrew the American-backed Batista regime and he established a pro-Soviet Marxist regime just 90 miles from the United States. Well, Eisenhower, not willing to sit this one out and simply let it happen, came up with a plan to arm and dispatch Cuban exiles to Cuba to foment an anti-communist revolution. Kennedy, upon entering office in 1960, inherited this plan, and he supports it. So it's a bipartisan effort. We're going to take some of these Cuban exiles, non-communist Cuban exiles, and we're going to arm them, and we're going to train them, and we're going to send them back to Cuba in hopes that they will overthrow the Marxist regime they will start a popular rebellion against the communist Fidel Castro, and they will restore liberty to Cuba. So there is the plan. The Cuban people will rise up, and of course they will be led by the secretly trained U.S. forces, and will overthrow Fidel Castro and the communist regime. Well, the Joint Chiefs of Staff promised Kennedy an easy victory. But Kennedy wants to hide any evidence of U.S. involvement. He wants to make it look like the Cubans have always been anti-communist and took this effort uh, upon themselves. So the invasion is scheduled for April 17, 1961, at what is called the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Kennedy agrees to a landing of 1,200 CIA-trained Cuban exiles but he says no Americans are going to take part in this and most importantly we're, there's going to be no American air support. This is going to appear to be a Cuban-led, Cuban-trained invasion force of Cuba, not an American-led invasion force of Cuba. Well, what happens is the exiles land on the beach at the Bay of Pigs they are immediately crushed and captured, and the American involvement is very quickly revealed, much to the humiliation of John F. Kennedy and the Democratic Party, and this in the opening months of John F. Kennedy's presidency. JFK takes full responsibility for the crisis at the Bay of Pigs and remarks, victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. So let's take a closer look at the newly established pro-Soviet Marxist regime that is just 90 miles from the United States on the island nation of Cuba. Its location offers the Soviet Union a unique opportunity to put the United States in check. And after the Bay of Pigs disaster, in which the American involvement is revealed and Kennedy looks like, well, a fool, Premier Khrushchev grows a lot bolder in his moves toward the United States and involving Cuba. And so in October 1962, an American spy plane flying over Cuba has revealed some very startling information. And you're looking at the exact photographs that that spy plane presented to the president. And what the president learns, and what the United States will soon learn, is that the Soviet Union's have installed nuclear missiles in Cuba, 
and they have the capability of striking at major US cities. So there's the map demonstrating the range of these missiles if they become operational. And if they were loaded with nuclear warheads, they could take out a number of American cities. We could see places like New York, Chicago, Washington DC, there's Houston, Denver, and several others go up in smoke. Could this be the end of American civilization? Obviously, the Kennedy administration is not going to permit those, mu those missiles to remain in Cuba any longer than they absolutely have to. So JFK meets with his attorney general, who is also his brother, Robert Kennedy, and they need to come up with some options, and they need to come up with them fast. So how about option one? We could open up negotiations with the USSR. But this could be seen as a sign of weakness, and we're already looking weak after the Bay of Pigs. Also, it gives the Soviets more time. You see, we know that there's missiles there, but we do not know if there are warheads there. And the warhead is what makes the thing nuclear. So a missile is scary, but when it's armed with a nuclear warhead, it is far more deadly. Option two, conduct a surgical strike against the missile sites. In other words, go in with the Air Force and take a shot at them and see if you can take them out. But this is an overt act of war against Cuba, and it will very likely draw the USSR into the fight. The third option is to blockade Cuban waters and prevent the warheads from arriving, that is, if they're not already there. But blockades are also an act of war. So what does John F. Kennedy decide to do? Well, he goes on national television and, make, and announces his decision. So Kennedy tells the American people and the Soviet Union the following. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba from whatever nation or port will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and, uh, cargo and carriers. We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. So in other words, it's a partial blockade. Now, this is technically an act of war, but Kennedy is very careful never to use the word blockade. He's going to use the word quarantine and therefore avoid the technical language that will likely provoke a belligerent response from the Soviet Union. And I find it interesting how he's quick to point out that we're not like you Soviets. We're not like Stalin who blockaded West Berlin in 1948. Remember that? And I think what he's doing is he's reminding the Soviets of their history. And he's saying, remember what Harry Truman did back in 1948 with the Berlin airlift? I'm willing to go almost to the brink as well. Kennedy goes on. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. So in other words, we're going to give the Soviet Union a firm warning on top of this. Those missiles should are not to be fired, not against anybody in the Western Hemisphere. And if they do, that's an act of war, and we will respond. And here on my map, you can see the 56 warships that are going to surround the Cuban islands in order to blockade anything from coming in or out, save for the necessities of life, as Kennedy put it. He says, we're going to eyeball, we're going eyeball to eyeball with the enemy, and we'll see who blinks. In a very tense moment in this, uh, in this crisis, the U.S. did, in fact, stop Soviet ships that were entering Cuba and, in fact, let them pass when they were found to not be carrying any nuclear warheads. In the end, a deal is struck between the Soviet Union and the United States. 
The U.S. promised it would remove its similar missiles from Turkey, which were aimed at the Soviet Union and had been for some time. In return, the Soviets are going to remove their missiles from Cuba. The United States will pledge to end the quarantine and never invade Cuba. Only in 1991 did the full dimensions of this nuclear peril become known, when the Russians revealed that their ground forces in Cuba already had operational nuclear weapons at their disposal and were authorized to launch them if they were attacked. On the 22nd of November 1963, JFK and the First Lady arrive in Dallas, Texas in order to campaign. You see, Democratic polls have been slipping ever since Kennedy had started to warm up to the Civil Rights Movement when he pledged his support for a Civil Rights Bill in 1963. And as you can see, a lot of folks in Texas are not terribly happy to see President Kennedy. You can see the presence of the Confederate flag and the sign that says, in 64, vote right, vote white, anyone but the NAACP's Kennedys. And then on the other side, Kennedy, why are you dedicated to socialism? So there's that accusation again that Kennedy is somehow a socialist. And right below it, I want you to make note of the 1964 makeshift campaign for Goldwater. That's Barry Goldwater, and we'll be looking at him in just a minute. Goldwater for Freedom in 1964. Well, as everybody knows, President Kennedy is not going to make it home from his Dallas visit that November because as he rides through the streets of Dallas in his open motorcade, he is shot and killed. But who did the deed? Was it a lone gunman from the textbook depository? Was it the CIA who disagreed with Kennedy's foreign policy? Was it President or Vice President Lyndon Johnson who so badly wanted to be president himself? Or, thanks Obama, well, in any case, Kennedy is assassinated that November of 1963, and Lyndon Johnson is going to be sworn in as president aboard Air Force One. Well, history will record that Lee Harvey Oswald, the man you see standing in front of you, is ultimately and singly responsible for killing President Kennedy that November day in 1963. This photograph that you see in front of you is part of the evidence that helped to convict Lee Harvey Oswald of the murder. Now, I think there are some funny things about this photograph, and I'm just going to point them out to you and let you make your own judgments. First off, let's have a look at the shadow underneath Oswald's chin. You'll notice that the shadow under his chin does not cast at the same angle as all of the other shadows in the picture, leading us to believe that either there are two suns casting two different light sources as this picture was taken, or that's not Oswald's head or his body, but both cannot be true. The other is, try standing at this pose. Try or arranging your hips in that manner. You'll find that it's incredibly uncomfortable and you won't be able to stand that long. Believe me, I've tried it and I've tried to have people take pictures of me as if doing it. Yes, I do strange things with my time. And believe me, this is not a very, e a very easy pose to maintain. Thirdly, if you were going to shoot the president, would you actually pose with the murder weapon and have someone film you with it? That seems rather incriminating, doesn't it? Lastly, if you were going to shoot the president, would you hold communist literature in front of you while you posed with the murder weapon at a strange angle with a different sun casting a different shadow underneath your chin? The whole thing seems a little bit fishy to me, but who am I? Vice President Johnson was sworn in under the 26th Amendment and assumes the presidency aboard Air Force One on his way home from Dallas. Now, Johnson never wanted to be president like this. He did want to be president, but on his own terms, on his own time. He didn't want to be an accidental or a hand-me-down president. And so when Johnson does assume the presidency, he decides he doesn't just want to be a good president, he wants to be a great president, one of the great presidents. His role model and personal hero is Franklin Roosevelt. And so we know this from the Civil Rights Unit. Johnson 
took a huge political risk soon after assuming the presidency. And that is he fulfilled one of uh, his predecessor, John F. Kennedy's promises to sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which Johnson made happen. Now, this creates a strong Southern reaction against Johnson by people such as Lester Maddox of Alabama and of course George Wallace, two people who become governors of that state and lead a strong anti-Johnson campaign throughout the 1960s. What Johnson is about to give America the Johnson treatment. You see, Johnson doesn't just want to stop with civil rights. His vision for America is much larger. In 1964, he soon announces that his administration has declared an unconditional war on poverty. And so one of the first things he does in pursuit of this war on poverty is to sign the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. The bill began programs such as Head Start, which is early childhood education for underprivileged children. Also, there's the Job Corps, which is job training and education for people who would not otherwise be able to find those resources. The goal of Johnson's, uh, Johnson's presidency was, as he put it, to end poverty in our time. Remember in our last unit how I had asked you to keep an eye on the Republican senator from Arizona by the name of Barry Goldwater? Remember the Senate vote on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and how this rogue senator from the West had refused to vote with the rest of his country and approve the Civil Rights Act of 1964? He stood more with the Solid South than he did with the North or the West. Well, he voted no. His name is Barry Goldwater. And let's find out why he thought that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was such a bad idea. He says, this bill will require the creation of a federal police force of mammoth proportions. It also bids fair to result in the development of an informer psychology in great areas of our national life. Neighbors spying on neighbors, workers spying on workers, businesses spying on businessmen. Those who would harass their fellow citizens for selfish and narrow purposes will have an ample inducement to do so. These, the federal police, force and informer psychology, are the hallmarks of the police state and landmarks in the destruction of a free society. And so Barry Goldwater believes that the Civil Rights Act is going to turn us into a police state, something of a McCarthyist state or a witch hunting state in which neighbor is after neighbor and business is after businessmen in order to enforce what he believes is an unenforceable psychology. Well, in 1964, Barry Goldwater has gathered such a following around him that he decides that to run for presidency under the Republican ticket. And so in the election of 1964, the choices between LBJ and the Great Society, the War on Poverty, and the expansion of civil rights, or Barry Goldwater and his conservative idea of how America should be. So let's take a closer look at what Barry Goldwater wants to see happen. This is an excerpt from Barry Goldwater's book, Conscience of a, of a Conservative, which was published in 1964 during the election campaign. He writes, I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. My aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. It is not to inaugurate new programs, but to cancel old ones that do violence to the Constitution, or that have failed their purpose, or that impose on the people an unwarranted financial burden. I will not attempt to discover whether legislation is needed before I have first determined whether it is constitutionally permissible. And if I should later be attacked for neglecting my constituents' interests, I shall reply that I was informed that their main interest is liberty and that in that cause I am doing the very best that I can. From Conscience of a Conservative, 1964. Well, in Barry Goldwater's domestic vision for America, he is going to offer what he calls a choice, not an echo. In other words, he's saying that no matter what, whether it's been a Republican or a Democrat, whether it's been Franklin Roosevelt or... Harry S. Truman, or even the middle of the road policy such as Dwight D. Eisenhower, what we've seen is an ever increasing expansion of the welfare state, an ever increasing enlargement of the scope and the power of the federal government. 
And Barry Goldwater wants to reduce the role of the federal government and its spending. So he says, let's roll back the New Deal and cancel some of these programs that are superfluous or do not work. He would like to reduce and limit Social Security. Now, let me be clear. He's not going to take it away. It's far too popular and would be political suicide to do so. But he does not want to expand it as Eisenhower did as in, and as Truman did and as Johnson is proposing to do as well. He would also like to virtually end all welfare programs. He believes that this is going to destroy our national fiber and that people should work rather than receive welfare. He also wants to repeal the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now let me say something about this. Barry Goldwater, although he makes common cause with people such as George Wallace or um, Lester Maddox, he does not share their views with regard to race relations. In fact, Barry Goldwater is probably something of a progressive when it comes to attitudes towards black people and other minorities. But what Barry Goldwater doesn't want to see happen is the federal government taking the lead in enforcing race relations and trying to impose an artificial race uh, race relation on America. And so he believes that things such as the um, Brown v. Board of Education decision, while it is well-intentioned, is taking the wrong approach. So in that vein, he would like to return education to the states and not try to enforce integration at the point of a bayonet, such as what happened in 1957 in Little Rock. Now, people say, isn't Goldwater a little bit extreme? And Goldwater, in his 1964 acceptance speech for the presidential nomination for the Republican Party, has an answer for this. This is the quotable Barry Goldwater. In his 1964 acceptance speech, he says, I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. One notable Goldwater supporter is the former FDR supporter and Hollywood actor Ronald Reagan. So far, you, re you may remember him as somebody who supported HUAC in the hunt for communists in Hollywood in the 1950s. Well, Ronald Reagan has kind of come out speaking against President Johnson and against the rising tide of liberalism in the Democratic Party. In his speech called A Time for Choosing, Ronald Reagan supports Goldwater with these words. Those who would trade our freedom for the soup kitchen of the welfare state have told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy accommodation. And they say, if we'll only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy, he'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. All who oppose them are indicted as warmongers. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. Well, perhaps there is a simple answer. Not an easy answer, but simple. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right. So here's Ronald Reagan talking about two things. He's talking about stopping the advance of government into the economic system, and he calls that the soup kitchen of the welfare state. And the other thing that he's talking about is a get tough policy with the Soviet Union. And you can see here, he's talking about refusal of containment. This isn't good enough. We cannot just contain the Soviet Union. We can't contain a cancer. We have to go out and we have to stop them. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right. You may be thinking that conservative movements attract an older crowd while younger people gravitate toward more liberal or leftist uh, policies. This is not always the case. And I know sometimes that that's the image of the 1960s that we received from textbooks. But the Goldwater movement was heavily populated by young people. This here is a picture of the Goldwater girls, who are girls who, young ladies, who would dress up in these western cowboy outfits and they would openly campaign for Goldwater, going door to door, telling people about their conservative values. So here's a pop quiz for you. Who said this quote? I was an active young Republican and later a Goldwater girl, right down to my cowboy outfit and straw cowboy hat emblazoned with the slogan AUH2O. I liked Senator Goldwater because he was a rugged individualist who swam against the political tide. Who said this in 1964? Was it Phyllis Schafley, 
the opponent of the ERA and today, one of today's major conservative leaders? Was it Hillary Clinton, the former First Lady, Senator of New York, and Secretary of State? Was it Betty Friedan, author of The Feminine Mystique and founder of NOW, the National Organization of Women? Or was it Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female Supreme Court Justice appointed by Bill Clinton? This may surprise you, but it was in fact Hillary Clinton who was a member of her high school's Goldwater Girls Club back in 1964. Goldwater's foreign policy is characterized by toughness and direct action with the Soviet Union. He re rejects the idea of containment, the older idea articulated by Harry Truman that what we need to do is stop Soviet expansion. He endorses an idea called rollback, not accommodation as he puts it. We need to reverse Soviet gains and win the Cold War, not just continue on in this stalemate. He wants to get tough with them, tell them we mean business. Shall we use nuclear weapons? Goldwater says, perhaps we should. We are confronted by a revolutionary world movement, and he's talking about communism, that possesses not only the will to dominate, ever, dominate absolutely every square mile of the globe, but increasingly the capacity to do so. And it has now reached the point where American leaders, both political and intellectual, are searching desperately for means of appeasing or accommodating the Soviet Union at the price of national survival. Now I want you to pay attention to some of the things he talks about. Goldwater is a believer, as is Johnson, as was Kennedy, as was Truman, as was Eisenhower, of the uh, worldwide communist movement, the revolutionary world movement. All communists are the same and they're all taking their orders from Moscow. This is not unique to Barry Goldwater or to the Republicans. This is what everybody is thinking. And it's not until Richard Nixon that we start to realize that this isn't the case and we can exploit those uh, fissures within the Soviet movement to our own advantage. The other thing I want to point out is that he uses the word appeasement or appeasing. And of course, he's calling attention back to Munich in 1938 in which Czechoslovakia was more or less handed over to Adolf Hitler. And of course, he is talking about not appeasing or accommodating the Soviet Union. Well, nobody really is, but he says we need to reverse their gains, not just contain them. Well, President Johnson is going to use uh, Barry Goldwater's rather extreme foreign policy views in a way that is advantageous to him. And he's going to put out a television commercial called Daisy Girl. And it airs only one time on September 7th, 1964. And it was so shocking and upsetting to some people that it never aired again, but it had the, the effect that President Johnson wanted to see. It begins with a little girl picking flowers in an open field, and she's counting down, nine, eight, seven, and then all of a sudden, you hear an announcer's voice coming over a loudspeaker as if a uh, missile is being launched, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, and then the screen goes dark and all you see is a nuclear explosion and fire and the, the smoke and the soot and the debris of this massive explosion. Uh, and the girl is, of course, you know, obliterated in this. And this is what's very frightening to people. And right at this, at this point in the commercial, President Johnson's voice comes over and he says, these are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must love each other, or we must die. And then the screen goes dark again, and an announcer's voice comes on and says, vote for President Johnson on November 3. The stakes are too high to stay home. Well, this commercial really freaks out the viewing public who sees this in 1964. And the message is, vote for President Johnson because Barry Goldwater is going to blow us all away. President Johnson is the one who's going to keep the world safe. President Johnson is the one who's going to not use the, the nuclear arsenal at our disposal. And Barry Goldwater, he cannot be trusted. And of course, one of the ironies here is that but President Johnson is going to be the one to escalate the war in Vietnam. What would Barry Goldwater do about it? Well, we just don't know. Here is the map showing the electoral results of the election of 1964 between the Democrat, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, and the Republican, Barry Goldwater. I want you to have a very good look at this, because what do you see? The Solid South 
has formally switched and has voted for its very first Republican, Barry Goldwater. Texas, of course, continued to support its, uh, its native son, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Arizona over there still voted for its senator, Barry Goldwater. But the entire country is Johnson country, except for the solid South. This is a momentous occasion. This is a time when you should stop and, and, and notice because you've been asking me all year, wait a minute, when does the solid South become Republican? We know that the, the South is strong Republican territory. When does it happen? It happens right here in the election of 1964, and there's going to be a little bit, uh, you know, going back here and there, but more or less, the South is now the domain of the Republican Party. And so it's worthwhile comparing what caused this to happen or one of the main things that caused this to happen. So let's look at the Solid South's vote, the Senate vote on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and then let's look at the electoral vote in the election of 1964. You can see that with the exception of some of the upper southern states, you have Virginia there and of course Tennessee, what you're seeing is almost a repeat. Florida still went uh, Democrat in 1964, but Arizona and then the Cotton Belt, the Cotton Belt states are going to defect to the Republican Party. Landslide Lyndon, as they call him, now believes that having been elected and not received the presidency because John F. Kennedy got shot, but having been elected, he now has the mandate to go on to build what he calls the Great Society. He wants to eradicate poverty and racism. He wants to improve education. He wants to encourage the arts, and he wants to promote environmentalism. And so he uses an occasion, an occasion at the University of Michigan in order to announce his vision to the students graduating there as well as to the world. He says, your imagination and your initiative and your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where old values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. For in your time, we have the opportunity to move not only toward the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. So the Great Society initiatives are going to kick off in 1965, and we'll start by looking at the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. To the right, there is President Johnson sitting with his former elementary school teacher who is accompanying him as he is about to sign the bill for this Education Act. You'll recall that Johnson did not start off his career as a politician, but as a school teacher, teaching fifth grade and then later high school debate. And he always believed that education was a very important part of achieving the American dream. And so to this end, he would like to sign a bill, he does sign a bill, that gives $1 billion in federal aid for teacher training and supplies low-income schools so they can meet the demands of an of a increasingly technological society. Later, he signs the Higher Education Act of 1966. This makes federal aid available in the form of grants and scholarships, especially to those affected by poverty. Later, Johnson signs Medicare. Now, this is an expansion of the Social Security Act in a way. It's health insurance for the elderly, funded by a surcharge on Social Security payroll taxes. Now, Medicare is, of course, still around today. A lot of elderly people are dependent on Medicare, Medicare for health insurance. Along with that is Medicaid. Medicaid is health insurance for the poor, and it's paid for by a general tax revenue provided by the states. Continuing on, Johnson signs the Wilderness Protection Act of 1965. This is going to save 9.1 million acres of forest land from industrial development and preserve that for future generations. It's also going to expand the national park system, and it's going to provide federal aid for establishing and maintaining public parks. It also mandates, uh, places mandates on pollution reduction and standards on clean air and water quality. There's also something in there for protection of endangered species and the beautification program for the national highway system. 
Continuing on, President Johnson also created the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 1965. And what this is, it, is it provides federal funding for hundreds of thousands of units of public housing for the poor. It, he invested in the urban rapid transit, such as the new Washington, D.C. Metro, and the Bay Area Rapid Transit, also known as BART, system in San Francisco, hoping, hoping that by facilitating public transportation, this will help people to find jobs that are not immediately located near their houses. He also gives new funding for law enforcement and urban beautification pro projects. Also part of the Great Society initiatives is the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, signed in 1965. This is going to provide for federal support for the work of writers, artists, and scholars to get their work to be known and, and supported. Also, the Immigration Act of 1965. You'll recall that the Immigration Act of 1924, or the National Origins Act, favored northern and western Europeans and did in fact discriminate against southern and eastern Europeans. This was passed in the 1920s during a, a time of increased nativism inside the United States. Well, the Immigration Act of 1965 is going to completely reverse that. It abandons the old quota system and replaces it with numerical limits that do not discriminate by race, ethnicity, or national origin. And so there you see LBJ sitting in front of Ellis Island, which is the entry point for most, uh, most of the new immigrants of the 1890s, and he's signing away that old quota system and signing into place the new Immigration Act of 1965. Well, we said that President Johnson's old hero was FDR. And in fact, President Johnson signed into law more bills, that's nearly 200 bills, designed to improve society than any other president except for Franklin Roosevelt. And you recall, FDR served for over three terms. So it's worth asking, did the Great Society have the intended effect? Did it work? Well, as with all of these big government programs, the Great Society has mixed reviews. Poverty rates have dropped from 12% to 20% during the time when the Great Society uh, initiatives were most active. Enrollment in public schools, including preschool, rose, especially among minorities. And so Head Start and the Education Acts that Johnson championed did seem to have an effect. Medicare and Medicaid did provide, and still do provide, society's most vulnerable, the elderly and the poor, with health care. Not many people want to overturn the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act of 1965, so I think perhaps a lot of us can agree that the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act are here to stay and probably should not be overturned. Now, the critics say that it did increase the size of the federal government and fosters dependency on the federal government through the extension of things such as Medicare and food stamps. Some say that while racism and poverty are undeniably bad, it is not the role of the federal government to address them or to try to make these things better. This is something that will be addressed by history itself and through the role of private citizens, not by the over, the over extending, extending hand of big government. One of the New Deal's critics is, of course, Ronald Reagan, and we're going to get to know him better in the 1980s. When he's running for president, he makes this comment. The press is dying to paint me as now trying to undo the New Deal. I remind them I voted for FDR four times. I'm trying to undo the Great Society. It was LBJ's war on poverty that led to our present mess. Well, I said before that the 1960s is characterized by numerous student movements which pop up on college campuses endorsing a spectrum of political views. One of these groups is led by a University of Michigan student named Tom Hayden, who organizes in 1962 SDS, or Students for a Democratic Society. Their birth certificate is the Port Huron Statement, and what this does is it outlines the program for what becomes the New Left. I want you to look at the Port Huron Statement right there to the left. We seek the establishment of a democracy, of individual participation, governed by two central aims, that the individual share in those social decisions determining the quality and direction of his life. 
that society be organized to encourage independence in men and provide the media for their common participation. Students for a Democratic Society's famous opening statement reads, We are the people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. See, these are the kids that grew up in the post-World War II era. These are the baby boomers. They grew up in the 1950s cultural consensus. They grew up watching I Love Lucy and living in Levittown, and, partic- and they're going to colleges now in order to participate in the military-industrial complex. And they are, as Tom Hayden says, looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. This coalition of student groups led by SDS becomes collectively known as the New Left. They are mainly idealistic college kids that are dedicating to making society more inclusive and more democratic. They called for political reforms, racial equality, and an expansion of workers' rights. One of their chief targets, however, was the educational system. You see, they believed that the educational system had become unresponsive to student needs and that it only served the military-industrial complex, not the student. In other words, it's raising us to make missiles and to make bombs. It's educating us for the cubicle, not for life. And so SDS adopted the term New Left to distinguish their efforts at the grassroots democracy from those of the old left of the 30s, which had espoused an orthodox Marxism. So the New Left, they're not outwardly socialists, they're not outwardly communists, but they are taking a more leftist approach than what we have seen in the 1950s. In 1964, a group of students at the University of California at Berkeley took the message of Tom Hayden and the SDS quite seriously. In 1964, at the University of California at Berkeley, the president of that institution announced that political demonstrations were to be hereby banned from campus. Now, that is a new move because the University of California at Berkeley had always had a free speech center in which students could make presentations on whatever topic they wanted to at whatever time they wanted to, so long as they weren't being outwardly disruptive or, or you know, openly hostile or, or just rude. Well, when the, the, the chancellor bans free speech, he really strikes a chord with a lot of students who feel like this is a move to take away some of their freedoms. And so several of the students in SDS who had spent the summer volunteering for Freedom Summer, recall they were trying to register black voters in the South, they return to school and are energized with the idealism and the spirit of protest. And so this move to ban free speech from their campus is really going to motivate and energize what is called the free speech movement at Berkeley. And so SDS stages a 600-person sit-in. They block the entry to major buildings and they basically refuse to allow the university to operate until free speech is restored on their campus. Now the student who emerges as the de facto leader of the free speech movement at Berkeley is named Mario Savio. And he's actually one of my personal heroes. I really like Mario Savio and I wrote about a 30 page paper on him in graduate school. Mario Savio is a Freedom Summer veteran, he's a civil rights leader, and God help us, he's a philosophy major. And so here you have the quotable Mario Savio. This is the speech that he gave in, spo- in front of Sproul Hall in 1964 against the administration's decision to shut down the free speech movement on his campus. He says, there's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers and upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. There's so much here. There's so much full of meat. This is so full of meaningful imagery that we could probably spend a full block day dissecting it and tearing it apart. 
the operation of the machine. He's talking about the educational bureaucracy at the University of California at Berkeley. It has become what he calls non-responsive to student needs. He believes that education is training people for the cubicle and not for life. It is not there to serve my personal development. It is there to service the economy, which is based on the production of missiles and weapons of war. And so Mario Savio is taking issue with this, and he wants to return the university to what he believes anyway, return it to the students and return it to a, uh, a situation that serves individual student needs and not the machine. And if we're not going to get that, this is the, this is the part you want to remember. Put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels. Use your physical presence as a way to stop the machine from running. And this is highlighted. This is demonstrated. We see this through the student protests and the sit-ins and the, the wait-ins and the read-ins and all of these activist student movements that we've been looking at where they, students and people are using their physical presences in order to stop injustice or what they see as injustice from operating. It's really a very powerful image and one that animates the protest movements of the new left in the 1960s. Not all of the student movements of the 1960s espoused a political leftist ideology. Barry Goldwater inspired a new generation of political activism within the American right wing. And the student group that bears this stamp is the Young Americans for Freedom, also called YAF. Now, they were founded in 1960, but they truly energized after the election of 1964 and the rise of Barry Goldwater. Now, they stood, as you can imagine, in opposition to the Great Society and to the New Deal, and they champion what they believe is a return to the free enterprise and a, re and, uh, a reduced role for the federal government, both in econo economic and personal life. Yaff articulated their beliefs in a statement known as the Sharon Statement. They write, In this time of moral and political crisis, it is the responsibility of the youth of America to affirm certain eternal truths. And we'll look at those truths now. Well, in the background here, you see a protest movement, a protest march taking place, uh, and it's not being led by Students for a Democratic Society or the Free Speech Movement. This is not a political leftist organization, but an organization of students that espouses beliefs and doctrines on the political right. And so you can barely make out the flag in the background. This is Young Americans for Freedom, and they are marching in support of the Vietnam War. This is part of the Sharon Statement that the market economy allocating resources by the free play of supply and demand is the single economic system compatible with the requirements of personal freedom and constitutional government, and that it is at the same time the most productive supplier of human needs. That when government interferes with the work of the market economy, it tends to reduce the moral and physical strength of the nation. That when it takes from, takes from one to bestow on another, it diminishes the incentive of the first, the integrity of the second, and the moral authority of both. That the forces of international communism are, at present, the greatest single threat to these liberties. That the United States should stress victory over, rather than coexistence with, this menace. And that American foreign policy must be judged by this criterion. Does it serve the just interests of the United States? These are quotes from the Sharon Statement, espoused by Young Americans for Freedom, which formed in 1960 and really gained momentum after 1964. And so there's a couple of things to notice here. One, this group is unequivoc unequivocally in support of the free market, of laissez-faire capitalism. And they believe that human liberty is best supported by the operation of the free market. Also. Have a look at this. They're taking a swipe at the uh, great society here. That when government interferes with the work of the market economy, it tends to reduce the moral and physical strength of this nation. In other words, when government gets involved, they do, in fact, diminish the moral and physical strength of the nation. When it takes from one and bestows on another, it diminishes the incentive of the first, the integrity of the second, and the moral authority of both. And of course, we're talking about welfare here, and we're talking about food stamps, and we're talking about social programs that tax one part of the, tax one part of the society and attempt to um, uplift or improve the conditions of the other. 
and they believe that this destroys both. And so the free market is one of their chief, um, they, they support the free market as one of their chief uh, ideologies. Now, although YAF is very large and it is very influential, it is somewhat out of step with the political climate of the 1960s. And you only need to look to the election results of 1964 to realize that. But the Young Americans for Freedom and the other conservative groups that coalesce around the universities around 1960 through 1965 do come of age in the 1980s. going to take a look at the Supreme Court in the 1960s, which is known as the Warren Court, named after Justice Earl Warren. In the 1960s, the Supreme Court was willing to take the lead on controversial social, political, and religious questions. Led by Chief Justice Earl Warren, Earl Warren the Warren Court is often considered to be the most liberal in American history because of its decisions regarding to free speech and civil liberties the rights of accused criminals, and Bible reading and school prayer. So the first Supreme Court case that we're going to look at has to do with Mary Beth Tinker, who is 13 years old, and John Tinker, who is 15 years old. They are high school students in the Des Moines Independent Community School District. Now the school district has prohibited these two students from wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. They can do it on their own personal time, so says the, the school district, but you can't do it in class and you can't do it in school. Well, the Tinkers disagree, citing the First Amendment protection of free speech in what becomes, becomes Tinker v. Des Moines, argued in 1969. Well, in this case, the school district argues that by wearing these armbands, you're disrupting the normal flow of the school day, and that wearing these armbands is not a form of free speech because you're not actually saying anything. Well, the Warren Court has something different to say. The Warren Court says, in wearing armbands, the petitioners were quiet and passive. They were not disruptive and did not impinge upon the rights of others. In these circumstances, their conduct was within the protection of the free speech clause of the First Amendment and the due process clause of the 14th. First Amendment rights are available to teachers and students subject to application in light of the special circumstances of the school environment. A prohibition against expression of opinion without any evidence that the rule is necessary to avoid substantial interference with school discipline or the rights of others is not permissible under the First and the Fourteenth Amendment. So, you have your two students there, Mary Beth and John Tinker, who are allowed to wear their black armbands to protest the Vietnam War and they are allowed to wear them in school because wearing them constitutes a form of symbolic speech which the court says is protected by the First Amendment. Another case involves the 1963 arrest of Ernesto Miranda in Arizona. Ernesto Miranda was arrested for kidnapping and rape by the Arizona police. Now, the arresting officers did not inform Miranda of the rights of accused criminals under Arizona or federal law. But the difficulty comes in when two hours later, Miranda confessed to the crime and he signed a statement saying that he was aware of his rights. So the question before the Warren Court is, are civil authorities required to notify the arrested defendants of their Fifth Amendment constitutional rights against self-incrimination before they interrogate the defendants? Well, the Warren Court rules on this as well, and they say, yeah, the government needs to notify arrested individuals of their Fifth Amendment constitutional rights, specifically of their right to remain silent. Without this notification, Anything admitted by an arrestee in an interrogation will not be admissible in court. Another question that the Warren Court tackles is school prayer. In New York in 1960, a group of parents assert that a school-mandated prayer violates their family's religious beliefs and that our students should not be required to say it, that our kids should not be required to, stay, to say this mandated school prayer in New York. 
They cite the First Amendment, which says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Well, the question is, does the First Amendment apply to the states because these are state-run schools and locally-run schools? And so the question is, does the First Amendment of the, of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, does it apply to the states in this regard? Do the states that receive federal aid violate the First Amendment when they require students to pray? So in other words, can the states require principals, teachers, and students to begin the day with prayers that are sponsored and written by the state. The Supreme Court says no. Here's their reasoning. We think that by using its public school system to encourage the recitation of the Regent's Prayer, the state of New York has adopted a practice wholly inconsistent with the Establishment Clause. That's the clause in the First Amendment. There can, of course, be no doubt that New York's program of daily classroom invocation of God's blessings as prescribed in the Regent's Prayer is a religious activity. It is a solemn avowal of divine faith and supplication for the blessings of the Almighty. The nature of such a prayer has always been religious. None of the respondents has denied this, and the trial court expressly so found. That being written by Justice Hugo Black in the Supreme Court case Engel v. Vital, decided in 1962. So, school-mandated prayer is unconstitutional, according to Engel v. Vital. But there are some important things to note about Engel v. Vital. The Engel decision does not prohibit voluntary or private prayer within the, school, the, the context of the school day. It does not ban religious organizations from campuses. And it does not prohibit students from wearing crosses or bringing religious materials, such as Bibles, to campus. What Engel v. Vital does is it simply states that the state cannot impose a prayer on its students. The state cannot mandate a prayer on its students. But students are free to, of course, practice their religion, display that religion, and speak about that decision. There's a few more court cases that we need to run through that the Warren Court is responsible for. One of them is named Abington v. Shemp, 1963. They rule that Bible reading in public schools is unconstitutional because it is an attempt to establish a religion. And this, of course, refers to the public Bible reading in public schools, not private Bible reading, which is undertaken by individual students or by religious groups, but by a teacher who is trying to indoctrinate or, or something to that effect. There's also Map v. Ohio in 1961. Evidence obtained illegally, when you arrest a guy, evidence obtained illegally violates the Fourth Amendment, which protects you against illegal search and seizure, and cannot be used in a court of law. Then there's Gideon v. v. Wainwright of 1963, in which says that all accused criminals had the right to a lawyer. If they cannot afford one, the state must appoint and pay for a public defender. Then there's Baker v. Carr, 1962, which says that electoral districts had to reflect the numbers of people in the district. So, I cannot make the smaller, wealthiest part of my city a district and the larger, poorer section also a dis an equal district. I have to be fair in my drawing of district lines. The Warren Court has come under a lot of criticism, especially from its conservative critics. Uh, the conservative critics continue to espouse the notion of strict constructionalism. That is, you recall, going all the way back to Jefferson, if it's not specifically in the Constitution, then the federal government is prohibited from taking action. So these critics accuse the court of what is called judicial interpretation. That is, expanding the Constitution beyond the framer's intent. And so some, but certainly not all, would say that the court case in um, the Des Moines v. Tinker court case would be an application of judicial interpretation by saying that, well, you know, the First Amendment doesn't talk about symbolic speech, it only talks about speech, and here you are expanding the meaning of the First Amendment to include things that I don't think James Madison meant to say when he put the words down in the, um, in the First Amendment. Whether this is true or not is, of course, your decision, but the question that uh, you might want to ask yourself is, is this more Hamilton, Hamiltonian or more Jeffersonian?